that God will bring the right people to hear this and that I'm going to break in the name of Jesus some things off of you and off of the nation. I know that's a bold statement, but if I'm sent, if I'm truly sent, then I have authority, the authority of the one that sends you. So I want to bring that word tomorrow. Let me finish real quick the seventh anointing that I never finished, and thank you for those that reminded me. The seventh is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, if that spirit were to fall upon us right now, it would be days before you could do much. This is the most powerful anointing that's ever in the arsenal of God. It is all of the other six rolled into one. And if you'll read Isaiah 11 carefully, it says that this is the one of the seven that Jesus delighted in. Of all the seven, he took his most delight. Can you imagine having revelation to know the heavenly realm and pull it in? You have revelation of wisdom to say the right thing. You have the revelation of counsel to steer and direct his disciples and his ministry. He has the spirit of power to break through every demonic stronghold. He has the spirit of revelation, all of these anointings. But the one that he took delight in was the spirit of the awe and wonder of God. The Hebrew word for fear. Uh, it would be good for you to do a analysis of that Hebrew word I have. And in the universe of meaning, uh, because linguistically, words typically have a universe of meaning. They, they mean something that is broader than just a narrow plan. So using the term, a universe of meaning, and you slice that universe into sections, the fear of the Lord can mean terror and dread. Absolutely. But it's also jaw-dropping worship. It's the astounding sense of awe. It, 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 it's like more than just like, oh, that's amazing, or that was really a good meeting. No, it, it's, it's something that, you know, for a, a long period of time, you're, you're in awe over. You're astounded. You're, it's jaw-dropping. It's heart-stopping. You, you can't put it into words, encounters. Now, I have tasted, I believe, a few times the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is the spirit of awakening. This is the spirit of revival when it comes upon a, a city and a people. And I can tell you that it is terrifying, but it is awesome. And it, it, all I can describe it in is a, a terrifying bliss. It, it's... Uh, everything you want and everything you want to run from at the same time. You don't know whether you want more or less. And if you want more, you can't take but a little bit more. But yet if you say less, then you don't want it to leave. It, it's just the most puzzling thing. And if it's ever happened to you, I don't need to explain it. But when Jesus walked through my wall and melted the wall of my bedroom and came into my house when I was alone, and I was weeping, and I was praying. And to be honest with you, I can only be honest, I was confessing my sin as a pastor. I was telling the Lord how I needed to love people more, that I had, wasn't the kind shepherd I needed to be, and I was, just, I was just sitting on my bedside, intimate with Jesus, and the piercing started. And it started just a pinprick in my heart. And I got pierced, and I said, Oh, Lord, I'm wrong when I do that. I'm wrong when I say those words. I'm wrong when I think these things. And then that pinprick, it got bigger. And like, oh, no. And then all of a sudden, matter of fact, I'm wrong all the time when I do all stuff. And I'm wrong to think of me. I'm wrong. To, and then <laughs> suddenly it got bigger. And then all of a sudden, I'm on my face, and he comes to the wall. And the, the wall of our house melted, and the burning man came in. And people say, was it an angel or was it him? Uh, it was him. And he was so bright and glorious and beautiful, and all I could do was weep, and I, I screamed, I shrieked, I was undone. To say undone is like major understatement. I was terrified. I was consumed. My, my life didn't flash in front of me, but all my sins did. And it was so much. I honestly... You know, I've loved God for 42 years and I, with, without any significant intermission. I mean, I've really tried to put my heart before him, but I'm telling you, 
when he stepped in the room, I was the most filthy, despicable, wretched thing in my own eyes that I had ever, ever looked at. I thought, of, and I, I thought a number of things. One is I've never done anything right. I've never done anything with the right motive. I've always had self attached. I've wanted something for me. I was selfish. I was wanting, you know, it was good but bad and mixed to it. And, and I just saw the mixture of my heart. I saw the corruption of my life, and it got worse, not better. And, and, and I, I just really wondered if I was a Christian. It's the truth. And the fire burned so strong and so hot, and I was just consumed. I literally... Was, was in the flame. The flame that came in the room was now upon me, burning me, consuming me. And, and I, I thought I was going to be nothing but a piece of garbage and ashes on the bedspread. And, uh, and my wife would come home and vacuum me, vacuum me up thinking I'm dirt on the, on the floor or something. Where's Brian? <laughs> and I did finally say, I don't know if it was an hour, it seemed like it was long, but yet, I don't know. Time stood still, it didn't matter, nothing in my house mattered, nothing in my life mattered, I didn't care about money, television, holidays, nothing. Didn't care about church, ministry, who applauded me or who, I didn't matter, I didn't care. All I knew is that the living Christ had come to me. And I was absolutely terrified. I think that's the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And apparently Jesus walked in that. Jesus operated in this awesome presence, burning presence of his Father, that he came from the fire and he, he came to the earth as a fire. He, he is the consuming God, the all-consuming God in human flesh. He veiled himself. He hid that glory for a season, but... But the one who came into my room, there was no veil and there was no hiding. I couldn't hide. I wish I could have. I wish I could have gone in the closet, under the bed, covered my head in the covers of the bedspread. I, I, was, I was undone. I felt naked. I felt wretched in every way. And then since then, it's, it's fallen in our meetings a few times. Not all the time, and I'm not trying to make it happen now. I just want to do what God wants me to do, and I feel like I'm to share the story. But when the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon a city, uh, mass conversions break out. People, any time, day or night, you'll hear the shrieks of people coming under the terror of God. And those who mock revival and mock spiritual awakening and say, it's finished, we don't need revival anymore, it's finished, we just hang on to grace, forget about all of that stuff, they have never seen it. I'm promising you, they never had what I had come into my room. You would never say that if you've tasted it. And I believe that anointing is going to break out in meetings. I believe it's going to break out in my meetings. I really do. I think it's going to happen. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tonight, right now. But when that burning fire came, it came in Florida when I was ministering there. I was, uh, uh, we're on our way. Uh, actually, we came back from the mission field. I had some health issues and I needed some recuperation. And a pastor friend found out that I was in the States and he said, oh, Brian, you got to come. And come and be with me, and we'll let you preach in the evenings, and I'll do mornings. I said, okay, whatever you want me to do. And So uh, the Sunday service in the morning was half the size of the Sunday service in the evening because the fire of God showed up, and the light of God, the burning torch came and, and lit up that entire church, and it doubled in the course of a few months. And uh, the evening service became greater than the morning service, and that doesn't do well for your relationship with the senior leader when that happens. But anyway, great confession of sin that nobody but Catholics believe in anymore. That's coming. What you going to do when he comes for you? Let's see how well you stand up to that when the fiery light of heaven comes into your room. So the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I'm going to ask God, my hand is on fire right now, whatever that means. But I'm gonna, and I do see some lights uh, right over here, right here in this r section, right there. The fiery light of God is moving. I would be surprised you don't feel something over in that area right now. Because uh, whether it's angelic or what, but there is a fire light right over here in this section. Is it okay that I tell you those things? Or I could just keep it secret. <laughs> there it is, more. 
So, Father, I'm going to put your hand over your heart and only pray this if you mean it. If you don't mean it, it's too scary to pray. Search me, O oh God. Open up my heart. Help me to be quick to confess every deviation of holiness. Burn your way into my heart. Open me up like never before. Break me open until I'm beyond repair. I'm perpetually broken open before you. Like, you're, like Jesus, like you were broken open before the Father. I receive the anointing of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I receive the anointing of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I welcome the revival anointing into my life. This is what Jesus delighted in. If you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to delight in this. And the people that oppose it, you love them, but understand, they've not experienced it. When they experience this, you don't have to teach on it anymore. Chantel, is that your name? You're going to go into a, a 90 day season of prophetic encounter in your life. You're going to receive personal prophetic ministry by prophets. Some of them will come to you privately, and some of them publicly will call you out. But you're going to enter into a season of fresh revelation. And your destiny is to become a walking prayer meeting. Your destiny is to carry mercy and to bring an atmosphere of glory and to bring an atmosphere of transcendence. Uh, I see you studying out books like theology, but, but hear me well, it's not like old systematic theology. It's almost like Knowing God by J.I. Packer and Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. I see you digging into some writings of people that have experiences, encounters, and Pastor Catherine could help you immensely with knowing steering you, uh, you know, to read some of the right stuff because she, she's got those books. But there, there's a, a, a fascination that's going to come over you, and this 90-day period is very important as you become this, this Shulamite, you become this, this, this Mary at his feet, loving him tenderly and pouring out your heart and asking for revelation, asking for knowledge. And the reason why you're going to get it and others may not is because you have a heart that's tender before God that says, teach me, Lord. I'm not a know-it-all, even though I, I think, are you a pastor's kid? No, but you've got a really good family, right? Okay, even though you have a tremendous family, they may be here today, I don't know, but your family's beautiful. But, you know, it, it's even more than what you've experienced in your life so far. So if you feel a strange tug to be alone with God, give in to that yearning. Give in to that because this is your destiny. You're going to get mandates for your destiny over the next 90 days. So what's that? That's like June, July, August. By the end of August, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have clarity and you and your pastor are going to have insights about your future and what you are to do. And, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to you a little bit with, uh, privately about that and uh, and uh, you know and I know but uh, make sure that you talk with your pastor and and expect miracles to come now 
It's uh, 4 o'clock. I'm, I feel like I'm going to go a, a few questions, if that's all right. And if you do need to leave because we want to be people of integrity and not keep you past the time we said. But, but I do want to just answer a few questions. A uh, precious friend came and, and said, uh, please answer this question. Of course, everybody wants their question answered. But uh, it's Isaiah 45, 11. And uh, the scripture is, command ye me, is what you've written down. That is... Uh, in the Hebrew text, that is a in, uh, interrogative, not a. Uh, it, it's a. Are you commanding me? Are you telling me what to do? That's what God is saying there. He's not inviting the church to command God, but he's saying, "Would you dare tell me? I'm the potter, you're the clay." So he in Isaiah 45. If you really look at that scripture carefully in the Hebrew text, it is. Uh, it's not the way uh, the King James has translated. This is why good translations are so important. Uh, I'm going to answer this one because it's kind of close to my heart, and it's a very good question. All of these are great questions, and I don't have time to go through all of them. Thank you for writing them out, and I'm going to take them and pray over them and ask uh, Angel of the Lord to visit you with revelation on the questions you asked. Some of them I, were too... Wonderful that I don't know that I could answer a number of questions were about tithing. You know, is it scriptural? Is it for today? And uh, Come on guys. The answer is, you know Why are why are we trying to be an accountant with God? You know uh, my wife and I far exceed the 10% uh, Anything that's ever given to our ministry is going to uh, you know, you're, you're just going to take we're taking a lot more than 10% and giving away. Che did a, a interview with apostles recently, and he had all of us tell him how much our giving was. Uh, and, and nobody of the apostles of our stream give less than 25%. So I'll just leave that. How about that? See? So if you're going to nickel and dime God, you're asking the wrong question. I'm not trying to be mean on this because I know it's sensitive in the Australian church culture about giving. But I think you need to understand you don't have to give. You get to give. Yeah. New covenant, old covenant is you have to give. Yeah. New covenant is, wow, I get to give. You don't ha I don't have to kiss my wife. I get to kiss her. Where is she? Oh. Come up here. Yeah. Ow! We'll save the visual display for later. Forget the question. <laughs> but no. I'm probably a little tired and I'm coming at that the wrong way, so please don't read any harshness. I don't mean that. It's a good question. There's nothing wrong with the question. It's just that there's a better question. How much is God's? That's the question to ask. Uh, here's one. Jesus said it was, oh, parables are for those that are outside. That would be uh, those that were not yet uh, part of his team. But the disciples, uh, they could have plain teaching. That's not really what it says. It says, I'm speaking to you in parables so that they will not understand. But I will explain it to you because you have the spirit of revelation. So um, then it goes on, is the book of Revelation a parable? I, I'm, I think if I'm reading into your question, uh, you're concerned that I would take all of the Bible and make it a parable. Well, I also probably assume you did not hear the four levels of teaching that I gave, the four interpretive models of interpreting the, the scriptures. And I've asked Joel and Pastor Catherine in the school here that you, you incorporate that teaching into the school so that every student understands that the Bible's literal, but the Bible can be applied, and the Bible is figurative, and the Bible is a mystical, glorious book that only God can unlock. Those four levels of interpretation. So is all the Bible parable? Yeah. Is all the Bible literal? Yeah. Can all the Bible apply to us? Yes. Are there deeper meanings to the Word of God? Yes. So uh, 
I know my model of teaching is different and it's allegorical type, shadows, signs, wonders, parables, illustrations, etc. But I do believe that that's the model that Jesus taught and I also believe that life comes out of this level of teaching. So concerning the book of Revelation, it is my belief, ask me next year, I may modify it, but it's my belief, 2013, I believe that the book of Revelation is the greatest parable in all the Bible. It is the unveiling of Jesus Christ in his church. It's not a map of coming events. It's the revelation of the coming one. It's not, about, uh, it's not just about judgment, but it's about the unveiling of Christ. And when Christ is unveiled, do you think there's going to be judgments? If the glory of Christ is unveiled on the earth in a people, yes, there's going to be judgments that are going to come forth. So it's such an intricate book, and it would take years for us to really go through it adequately. But the real short answer, maybe a question, a, a short question for you, is does your interpretation of Revelation give you life, or does it give you fear? And God is not the God who gives the spirit of fear. So you, you kind of do the math and realize that they have looked at, they've analyzed that book upside one side and down the other. And until you come to the conclusion that the Christ in you company is coming to the earth and we are bringing back the king, we're bringing the kingdom into the earth, we're pulling the heavenlies. This is why we pray thy kingdom come. Why are we praying it? Why don't we pray uh, thy rapture come? Here's a kind of a, oh, let me do this one, uh, Book of Enoch. I had some good questions on that. Uh, very timely question because I'm, I'm really pouring into manuscripts. I, I'm a researcher, and I really like the manuscripts of the Bible. And there's an interesting book. I'm not saying I agree with every one of his theorems of every one of his ideas, but it's called, I think it's called the New New Testament. And he's proposing that there be a global convening of scholars and leaders in the ch Christian faith to reconsider the addition of other books to the Bible. And uh, the book of Enoch was probably number one on everybody's list. If there was ever to be another book added to the written scriptures, most likely it would be the consideration of the book of Enoch. I've read it a few times, and it is quoted uh, in the book of Jude. Did you know that? It is a, uh, a pseudographical book. It is not considered to be part of the canon of Scripture by the, uh, by the, the um, Council of Nicaea and other councils of apostles and church leaders through church history. They've analyzed this. They've gone through this. And uh, it was considered to be in the running, but it was left out. Having said that, let me tell you, Martin Luther ripped James out of his Bible. And uh, there have been leaders and scholars that have, are convinced. Do you realize that there were Bibles that were printed that did not have the book of Revelation in it? And only with great insistence by, by some church fathers did Revelation get included in the canon. So if you go back through the formation of our Bible, uh, which book is to be included? There, there's the... The, uh, there is the, um, there, the God, let's see, what's it called? The works of John? No, the Acts, the Acts of John. There's a, a gospel or a book written called the Acts of John. It dates back to like the time of Jesus. And it talks about John uh, being boiled in oil. It talks about him, they tried to kill him in front of the Colosseum with thousands of people there. And when he was boiled in front of everybody's eyes and came out alive, the entire Colosseum got saved. Everybody was converted. It's in the, 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 uh, the Acts of John. And then because of that, Nero <laughs> said, maybe I shouldn't try to hurt this guy anymore because it's causing the opposite effect. So they throw him on an island called Patmos, and then John gets the book of Revelation. So there's, there's books out there that are fascinating. I can't tell you to go read them necessarily or uh, definitely uh, 
the 66 books of the Bible are inspired of God and they are the, the completed scriptures in my thinking. Is the book of Enoch valuable? Yeah, it's interesting. It has some really cool things and it is quoted in the, in the book of Jude. Isn't that interesting? Uh, what do I think about uh, First Enoch? There's a book of Jubilees. There's a book of the Wars of the Lord. There's the book of the Gospel of Thomas, which is very distorted. There, there's, I've read all of these pseudographical books because I want to, I wanna, you know, as, as a Bible guy, I want to make sure that I have a uh, knowledge that goes beyond tradition, but I want to learn. I'll just put it that way. I don't read the books because I believe they're the Bible, but I read them to just, they're kind of cool. All right. I read a lot of stuff. Okay, brilliant question. Catherine, tell me when we, when we run out of time, because I'll quit whenever you want me to. Um, brilliant question. So with the end times, where are we now? What does the end look like? What outlook should we have? <laughs> well, the end of the world was when Jesus was crucified. The world ended for me. The world was, I was crucified to the world, the world crucified to me. The end of the world has already happened. You know, the second coming, if you really think about it, and I shared this in one meeting, and I got nasty emails. I was, told me I was a heretic and blah, blah, blah. Come on, give me a break. When Jesus said, I will come again, I will send the comforter, and, and I will, he says, I'm coming back in the spirit. So in a, in a crazy sense, the second coming happened at Pentecost. So we really are looking to the third coming. But anyway, I'm just saying that to stretch you a little bit. The commonly perceived idea of the second coming, of course, is the bodily return of Jesus. And there were other questions asking me if I actually believe in the bodily return. I get that a lot because of the way I teach. The answer is yes. Jesus is bodily. The, the man, Christ Jesus, is coming back to the earth to judge the living and the dead. He will be the Lord of glory. He will establish his throne upon this planet, and we will be his, in his kingdom forever and ever. And uh, I personally believe the eternal realm is coming to the earth and that we are to establish the kingdom of God. I believe that Jesus is not coming back for a long, long time. I believe that we have to bring him back and we hasten the coming by yielding to his spirit and allowing the fullness of his image to come forth in us. And, and um, as, as he comes forth in his bride, in his people, he will physically return to the earth. Where are we right now? We're in the days of restoration, Acts 321, where God is restoring all things by Christ. Jesus is making all things new. So we are in the season of the second great apostolic reformation. Two days ago, we had our first one. Now we're in the third day revelation, the third day resurrection power, we're in the day of the second apostolic reformation. And churches like this and other river churches and prophetic ministries and churches with apostolic revelation, uh, we are growing in number. The fastest growing segment of the body of Christ is the apostolic prophetic stream touching the nations. Did you know that? Denominations are not growing. Typically, there are exceptions. But the fastest growing stream are apostolic, prophetic-led churches that have welcomed the Holy Spirit, you're clear for landing, and they put the welcome mat outside the front door and say, this is about you, Jesus, and we want to build with the gifts, fruit, power, and wisdom of God. Uh, I know my friend Bob Jones, he's a prophet, and he has had the 50-year prophecy. I don't know if any of you have heard that, but... Um, he believes that, that uh, this is a decade, starting in 2010, we're in a 10-year period where glory is being restored to the church. And starting in 2020, we're going to be in the period where family is restored to the church. And 2030, we're going to be in the season of government and apostolic authority. The, uh, the true apostolic by 20, what did I say, 2030, 
will be uh, will be fully unveiled. So what we're seeing now are prototypes and forerunners, but and then and then 2050 uh, is the is the decade. The 2050s is the decade of the kingdom of God really starting to take shape on the planet. So uh, all of the fears and economies ebb and flow, stock markets. Military, you know, everybody that has any eyes of discernment knows that China is rising. That that by 2020, China will have the greatest economy, and will become uh, a, a great global power. And the prophecies has been that China and the U.S., United States, and China will forge a friendship by 2020 that will shock the world. And uh, the blessings of America and the blessings of China will mingle and produce global harvest and will fund the Back to Jerusalem movement, where we, we see the gospel has gone from you know Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and it's in its flow to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's like the power of the gospel light went into Europe. But Europe is now dim. And then it went over to the U.S. But now the U.S. is dimming. Unfortunately, I, it breaks my heart to say it, but the church is in a... a, a uh, it's, we, we've, had our, our, we've had our go at this, and we still have gifts to give to the world. We still have, you know, redemptive qualities. America, just like Australia, has redemptive qualities for the world. America is still going to be of global power for years and decades to come. But the, the light of the gospel is moving. It's going west. And now, guess what? Australia, you're here. And, and if you do not take this, it will skip quickly to Southeast Asia, and it will go into the Asia continent and the subcontinent of India. And, and uh, But you really need to know that this, your nation is to be the exporter of revival. You are exporting awakening and revival to the nations. If you took Holy Spirit from Australia, what a crazy place to live. I mean, church will get religious, boring, leaders can get kind of mean and tough, and everything gets weird. But with the Holy Spirit, the Aussie culture and the dynamic over this land, this continent, is, is such a haven of the Holy Spirit. The great Southland and, and uh, New Zealand as well. The great Southland of the, and Tasmania as well, because my wife and I really own, uh, in a good way, not owning, you know, in any other way other than heart level. We own that state of Tasmania. My wife and I love that area, and we plan on ministering even more there uh, perhaps the next time we're back. But China and Asia, and it's headed all the way back as the planet is encircled, and uh, Jesus is going to do some marvelous things in Jerusalem. Okay. Um... Yes. Answer to that one's yes. Oh, the question. Uh, Matthew, Matthew 27, 52, Jesus died. Bodies of many holy people died, were raised to life, came out in the holy city. Was this literal? And who was it? Yes. Was it Abraham, I, Isaac, Joseph, Joseph, everyone? Yes. I think that um, uh, I think the spirit of death was broken off of our planet. It's called the shroud the shroud over the earth, the veil that's over our planet. In the book of Isaiah, I forget the reference, but there's a scripture that says the veil that's over the earth uh, uh, is the spirit of death, and that death was broken when Christ rose from the dead, and the exceeding greatness of his power lifted off of the planet the spirit of death that no longer has legal access except where we allow it. And uh, uh, to take it even further, I believe that there will be a generation that won't die. I believe God can raise up a people that live beyond and have the supernatural realm. And I get this clearly from Revelation 12 and some other things that the Lord's shown me. But I believe that the last enemy to be destroyed is death and that the church is going to have power over death. If the Christ in us has power to raise a billion people on one day, yeah. then he can, he can keep you alive. And, uh, you know, anyway, even talks about they couldn't kill him in the book of Revelation. So anyway. All right. Uh, will the Lord physically return? Yeah, I answered that one. The answer is yes. Um, Ephesians 5.25, good question. Uh, it's concerning marriage, and it has to do with uh, my translation and the message. 
where the message is, I, I didn't realize this, but it says, a husband's words evoke her beauty. I love that. And they're asking me if that can be a fair translation of the Hebrew and how come I got my translation that's different. And the answer is, uh, I'll have to look into that. But I do know that the Greek word uh, uh, there is that the, the husband beautifies the wife. He washes her and cleanses her. So I think that's true. I think with our words, we affirm the beauty of our wife. You look at this woman next to me. I mean, I got, uh, she's about to melt the couch. She's so hot. <laughs> ooh, ooh. And so I think a husband establishes the identity of the wife. I think uh, so many women need the husband to affirm them and, and, and a father to a daughter. And if a father's never done it to a daughter, I think the young girls end up trying to find a guy that will. And they'll do it the wrong way. You know, they'll try to get a guy's affection in the wrong way. So uh, what a man, the, the male identity has authority. If Adam could name the animals, then he has power to bring identity to people and things. So as we speak, we can bring identity. I try to tell my wife as many times as I can a day how beautiful he is, she is and how much I love her. Now, I'm not saying I do it every day, but I do my best sometimes, occasionally. But... <laughs> Enough of that. Who are the two sons in the prodigal uh, parable of the prodigal sons? Uh, one was younger, the other was older. Uh, of course, dispensationally, we would interpret that as the older son being the Jew and the younger son being Gentiles, which tends to fit with what uh, Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees. But in another way, I think the older son could be anybody that's religious, that feels like, you know, God shouldn't show grace. It's funny how grace does uh, mess with the religious people. It's like the woman caught in adultery. Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Do you know that most Greek manuscripts don't even have that? The most reliable Greek manuscripts don't have it. But I spent an entire day, and I researched this out as thoroughly as I could, and I have some great tools to do it. And I found Augustine and some of the church fathers in their writings quoted that text and actually said that there were translators who refused to, that, that cut it out of the Bible. They refused to translate it, and that it truly is anointed of God. And there are actually, the oldest Greek manuscripts have a gap in the text a space where it was like white out or they, they cut and paste, they took it out of the Bible. So, yes, you can make an argument that that shouldn't be there, but uh, when you get my Gospel of John, I have, a, I think, an adequate footnote to explain why it should be part of the Scripture. There's so many places in the Bible where they take out the supernatural, they take out the extravagant grace portions, and they water it down, and they, they put women down. There's a lot of Scriptures where leaders are women names, but they'll never, you'll never know that. Did you know one of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas is her name? It's a woman. Some believe it's Peter's wife. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You, I know the, 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 the macho guys can't handle that, but that Jesus would come to a woman. Yeah. At least. And her, her name was Cleopas. And you will not find a commentary that will tell you that that was a woman. They're going to keep it right out of your understanding. Well, that's why many believe it was Peter and, and his wife. So that would have been Peter's wife. There, are, there is a case to make that the two disciples were Peter and his wife. You, ha you have to kind of do some gymnastics a little bit to make Peter there because of the chronology of the appearance of Christ and stuff. I, I, I don't know. I, I tend to think it was two women. But then you have Jesus walking with two women, so which uh, he's fine with. I kind of, some of these I've kind of answered. Do I believe in the rapture? Yes. I got raptured 2,000 years ago, 
Last night I was raptured. I was taken in the spirit realm. I don't even know exactly where I went. I know some places where I went. Um, the, rapture, the word rapture, your homework is go find that in the Bible. Go find the word rapture. Look for the word rapture in the Bible. Come back and tell me tomorrow where rapture is found in the Bible. Now, you know about the two are lying in the bed, one taken, the other left? One's taken in judgment, the other's left to go into the kingdom of authority and power? You didn't hear me. You got it backwards. Two are in the field, one's taken in judgment. The other's left. Because it's the days of Noah. The key is, as it was in the days of Noah. Now, in the days of Noah, who was taken away? The wicked. And who was left to establish a brand new era? As it was in the days of Noah. Cha-ching! Bang, 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 bang. Yeah, we got to read the Bible not from novels. I mean, if you're getting your eschatology out of novels, bro, I want to be left behind. Leave me behind. I think I'm done, Pastor Catherine. I didn't answer all the questions. I'm sorry, but uh, love you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. That was fun. Hallelujah. Well, I, uh, I just want to encourage you. Uh, Brian will be sharing uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. As I said, uh, he's going to have a break tonight, and I think he deserves a break. Yeah, and uh, uh, but 4 p.m., you will want to come. It's going to be fun. We are just so grateful to be able to just sit and listen and just be taught. It is so, we, we truly are hungry, and we just really receive it. Would you reach your hands out toward these guys right now? I want to pray the blessing of God over them. We just want to release <laughs> glorious, refreshing delight. But you know what I really want you to pray? I want you to pray that they will have favor in all the nations, that they will have favor with pastors and leaders, that they will have favor to get the word out, that the Passion Translation would have such favor and supernatural acceleration upon it, Lord God. We declare, Lord, increase, even as he is poured out, Lord, multiply it back to him, Father. We ask but well, it'll be so easy. It'll be, it'll be so easy. Even in his sleep, God, the downloads would come. It would just flow like a river. Morning by morning, your mercies will be new, Lord. It'll flow like a river. And Lord, we declare, Lord, he has favor, that there is double doors of favor opening for him in the nations. Hallelujah. We declare double doors of favor in this nation in Australia. We declare double doors of favor in the body of Christ. We declare that the time has come hallelujah to release and unlock the 66 books we declare it is the time has come for the unlocking of revelation the blessing of god poured out we say here we are god find your resting place in the name of jesus we bless them we bless them lord with refreshing we bless their family we bless lord god their all of their family, their extended family. Lord, we speak the blessing of God. We thank you that you surround them, you cover them, you put your arms around them. Lord, you give them such grace, Lord. You give these guys such grace to travel. You give them grace to sleep, grace to, to just walk in divine health and blessing, God. We ask that they would be so blessed. They'd be blessed coming in. They'd be blessed going out. Lord, we declare the favor, the wisdom, oh God. Lord, we declare, Lord, that their thoughts, their speech, everything, Father, is just carried by your sweet kindness. You'd bless them indeed. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Why don't we give them one final round of applause? Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, could I ask you uh, a favor? If you would just look around as you go out. Uh, we, New Hope do have the building tomorrow morning. Outbreak is going to be here tonight. Daniel Fuller is going to be speaking. It's going to be good. Um, 
So, but we really want to make sure that we are just stewarding. We share the building with New Hope. They have their service Sunday morning. So if you see any coffee cups or little pieces of paper or anything that you could possibly help us just clean up, we'd really like to have it ready uh, for these guys to come in tonight and for the church tomorrow morning. So if you could just take a few moments just to help us with that, that would be wonderful. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon. God bless you.